the time, one third of the time, they don't work. <laughs> it's not a problem if you have courage. Yes. Госпожа Мадловски, из вашего выступления вы поняли, что для капитализма большое значение имеет наличие в людях семи добродетелей, включая трех христианских, вера, надежда и любви. Я полагаю, что за эти 48 часов вы разобрались, что Россия не является особенно религиозной страной. Социологические опросы показывают, что в России намного больше православных, чем христиан. Не удивляйтесь, такое бывает. А, а отсюда, а, сказать, отсюда у меня вопрос. Вы, а, как вы считаете, а, в какой мере капитализм может существовать а, без христианства и является ли слабость христианства в России одной из тех проблем, которые ведет вот к этой недооценке достоинства личности? Thank you to the Adam Smith Forum, thank you to the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung for their generous support. It's a great pleasure to be back in Moscow, a city that has changed so much during my various visits. When I first came in the 1980s, I came here to find advocates of liberty. And it was not easy going to uh, parties, 
and boring, horrible academic conferences with terrible American communist sympathizers who came here to worship the Soviet Union. But it was the only way to get an invitation <laughs> from the Academy of Sciences of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So I had to deal with really boring, stupid, horrible American communists. <laughs> and I realized that the Soviet counterparts didn't believe in communism. The only communists in the room were Americans. What the Soviet bureaucrats wanted was an invitation to the other conference in California <laughs> where they could drink very nice chilled wine and sit in a hot tub with young women. <laughs> I did meet uh, Larisa Piasheva, who was a wonderful lady, and Boris Pinsker, and with them was able to arrange translation of socialism by Ludwig Kamisis into the Russian language, Friedrich Hayek's books, and others in the Soviet Union, and then organized the first Cato Institute conference in the Soviet Union in 1990, which was also an amazing experience. The mayor of Moscow had the police deliver apples to the conference. So I remember that time very vividly. And by the way, the apples were terrible. They were not like apples you can buy in any Russian supermarket today. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about this question of the morality of capitalism, especially here in modern Russia, because there are so many important themes that need to be distinguished. I have a little book out in English, The Morality of Capitalism, and if you want, you can also read it in uh, Persian. This was published in Tehran recently. I was very happy the mullahs actually allowed publication of a libertarian book. Uh, it was just in uh, Kenya, and the African edition came out, the African introduction by a Nigerian <coughs> economist. Notably, it's called Free Market and Justice. I'll talk about why the title is different in a moment. And the Russian edition is also available, and will be in the back later on, for I'm told the unbelievably high price of 100 rubles. <laughs> Now, the first question to discuss in some meaningful sense, what is capitalism? And that term has been contested from the very beginning. Uh, Fernand Braudel, in his uh, wonderful three-volume study, traced the term capital back to the 12th and 13th centuries to refer to, and I quote, funds, stock and merchandise, sum of money, or money carrying interest. And he noted in a very dry way that of the many uses of the term, the word is never used in a friendly sense. It was always had some negative connotation. The term capitalism emerges generally as a term of abuse, pardon me, the term capitalist in the 19th century. For example, by Louis Blanc, who referred to it as the process of <coughs> the appropriation of capital by some to the exclusion of others. So it was inherently, oh, thank you. Here you go. This is the Russian edition. And the movie version will be coming out soon. Uh, Brad Pitt will be playing me in the movie version. Uh, Louis Blanc, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, referred to it as exclusive, as a predatory uh, sense to the word. Marx writes of the capitalist mode of production, which he saw as driven by the appropriation of the surplus value created by labor. So it was inherently a process of exploitation, accumulation of capital, because all value is created by labor, and it is expropriated by the capitalists, following the terms used by Louis Blanc. But the term capitalism is introduced by Werner Zomba in 1912 in his book, Der Moderna Capitalismus. And that term then came into general use around the world. It's very important to recognize it is a term created by the enemies of a system. Whatever capitalism is, it was named by people who did not like it, who thought that it was evil or needed to be eliminated. There's a 
another form of confusion, even in this book, in the title rather, the book, Bourgeois Dignity, which I really recommend, <coughs> and I hope I do not offend Deirdre. I think the second volume is better than the first. I hope the third volume will be even better than the second. So there's a proper, but this is a very interesting book. I highly recommend it, and I look forward to seeing the Russian edition of it. The term bourgeois, uh, as it's introduced, it comes from the German bürgerlich, people who live in a burg, in a strong place, a fortified place, a city with walls where they can be safe and secure. And from this, in English, many words are derived. Pittsburgh is the city of William Pitt. Hillsborough, borough comes from Borg, and many other terms as well. The first legislature in America in the British colonies was called the House of Burgers. It meant the citizens, which was connected to people who lived in cities. Cities were known as places of freedom. Stadtluft macht frei, nach Ablaufen von Jahr und Tag. City air makes you free after the passage of one year and one year. If you are a serf and you escape to the city for one year and one day, going from one Starbucks to another, you become a free person. That was a city, was a place of liberty. The term enters into French, and the French have a genetic defect. They cannot say German words. So bürgerlich becomes bourgeois. It's a very sad element of the French condition. And it then enters English again, bourgeois, bourgeoisie, with a negative connotation. It means middle class, boring, everyday, stupid, suburban, and so on. It has a strongly negative sense. Bürgera is talking about the way in which this should have been viewed as a positive condition. But most intellectuals employ these terms in a negative way. Marx adds to the confusion. Because this group, the Bürgerlich uh, group, the bourgeoisie, he identifies with two social classes, which we might want to distinguish. On the one hand, those who acquire capital, industrialists, people who save, identified with this urban kind of economic behavior. And then secondly, <coughs> in his political writings, he identifies them as a political class of owners of government bonds. We call them rentiers of the public debt. So people who are somehow dependent on the state. And then he uses the terms interchangeably. But we might want to distinguish these as two different economic functions, at the least. The one who bears risk by starting a factory, taking capital and investing it, on the one hand. And on the other, the person who invests his money in government bonds and all of the things that we associate with that. Lobbying, corruption, desire for more, government expenditure, and so on. So there's a very, very deep confusion that's come down to us. Even if we are not Marxists, we inherit this language. It carries with it certain meaning. It's not a surprise, then, that cronyism is so often identified with capitalism. But I think we need to keep them very distinct. First. Cronyism is not unique to capitalism. Everyone above a certain age knows there was crony socialism, <coughs> crony communism. That's unmistakable. All the special privileges of those people who had connections, with party members, they had access to better things than the normal people. I remember in Hungary, when they opened up, I went with students to visit facilities of the Communist Party were now open for the first time to the public, they were really angry. They said, we knew those bastards lived a certain life, but we didn't know really how it was. And they saw there was real cronyism under the system they grew up in. And we know that this was typical experience. 
So cronyism, capitalism, we need to distinguish those as well. We find cronyism every place there are states and governments and people with power. I think capitalism is really something very different. It's the solution to cronyism, to get rid of all of these privileges. So maybe, however, we're better off abandoning the term. Capitalism may be a poisoned word. It comes from the enemies of the system they identify, and it carries with it these other layers of meaning that are very difficult to take off. I'm very sympathetic to that attitude to say we should get rid of the term or not use it. But there's a problem. If we simply say free market, and that's what our African colleagues did with their edition of this little book. They said capitalism is a poisoned word in most of Africa. We can't use it. It's associated with so many terrible things that are not what we mean. So they called it free markets and justice instead. But the problem is that merely free market does not capture what it is that characterizes the modern society of equality and freedom and prosperity. Let me give you a simple example. I spend a lot of time in the Middle East. And you go in Arab countries and uh, Persian-speaking or Kurdish-speaking areas, there are bazaars. Everyone knows the bazaar. And gold markets. You see gold markets. There are rows of gold merchants. Along comes a naive libertarian from Chicago. Not this one, but her colleagues, who I think are probably naive. And they say, look, they can have capitalism. They have a market. I went to the market, and we bargained. That's capitalism. And they have gold. That, oh, wow, the gold standard. They are really capitalists. In my opinion, they completely misunderstand what they are seeing. These are signs of underdeveloped legal institutions. They're the signs of the absence of free market capitalism. First, why is there a gold market? Because everyone knows you cannot trust the money and the banks. They're totally unreliable. So people buy money and they wear it on themselves. That tells you this is not a a well-developed legal culture. Second, the bazaar. Everyone bargains. Capitalism is not about bargaining. People bargain under socialism also. Bargaining is human. Everyone bargains. What you have is what is called a spot market, in which you do the following. You say, I'll put this on the table, you put your money on the table. Now we trade. There's no trust. <coughs> Zero trust. And if later you don't like the good or you open it and it's broken, try to get your money back. Very difficult. There's no property rights in this case. So all exchange is a spot exchange. You cannot have long-term contracts because you don't have trust. And there's no legal system to enforce it. These are not signs of capitalism. They're signs of the absence of free market capitalism. What do we need? for free market capitalism. The rule of law, number one. That's a very difficult to translate phrase. I was in Egypt with a friend, a colleague from India, Gurcharan Das, who's a very famous Indian businessman. And he gave a speech in front of 150,000 people in Tahrir Square. We went with our Egyptian libertarian colleagues, one is a woman named Nancy Ibrahim. She has very good elbows. And she got our libertarian friends to the podium, past the Muslim Brotherhood. And Gurcharan spoke, and he said, the most important thing in democracy is the rule of law. I've never seen anyone give a speech on the rule of law to 150,000 people. It was a unique experience. My colleague, Dr. Noah al Khamuzi from Morocco, translated. After the rule of law, he held Gertrude's hand and he spoke for a minute and a half. 
to explain what rule of law means in Arabic. It's not a clear expression. It's very difficult. So he, Gertrude wanted to continue to speak, and he held it. No, no, no. And for 90 seconds, he had to translate rule of law into Arabic. I'm tr I trust he did a good job. But it was difficult to convey those simple terms. You need property rights that have what we call the three Ds. The letter D in English, they are definable, so we can know what is yours and what is mine. When you go to poor countries, you find people fight constantly because they don't know what belongs to me and what belongs to you. So we invest in fighting and struggling rather than trading and producing. Second, they must be defendable. You should be able to defend it from a criminal. For that, we have simple mechanisms. You don't always need the state. If someone <coughs> tries to take my Google boss coat, he will meet my personal protection agent, which is called my fist. And it's very effective. No one tries to take my clothes because I'm a tough guy. We invest in protecting our property with keys and locks. When you go to your car, you put in the key. Why? It's very expensive. I learned that I lost my key from my car. It cost me $200 to buy a new one. That's a lot of money. Why? We have it to protect from thieves. So we invest privately in defending our property. I was once in Switzerland and I saw the only place in my life people drove motorbikes with no keys. There was a button on and off, start and stop. I was amazed. It told me there are no thieves in these villages. Maybe there were at one time and something bad happened to them. But there are no thieves. But don't do this in Moscow, New York, London, Paris. Maybe Tokyo, you could. But most cities, it's a bad idea. However, for more complex <coughs> forms of property, like shares of a company, or bonds, or the right to a flow of income, a fist doesn't work, and a key or a lock doesn't work. For that, we need courts of law that are reliable, objective, and fair. And then the third thing, but I should add on the second D, it should be defendable also from the state, the biggest criminals around usually live in got work in government offices. You need to be defend, able to defend from them also. The third D is called divestible. That's an old-fashioned English word. It means transferable. But as you know, if we had transferable, you would have DDT, which is illegal under international law. <laughs> so we have to have DDD, divestible. It means you can transfer to another person easily. You can sell it. You can give it away. It's not a difficult activity. Most countries in the world, the legal system makes it very difficult to do that. It's extremely costly to have access to the legal system. I'll take a simple example. Compare Guatemala and Canada. If you want to leave a will in Guatemala, to leave something to your children or your family, you must have a lawyer. It's required. And of course, who is behind this law? The lawyers. The lawyers, of course. It's a cartel. It's very expensive. It might cost you $100. And for a very poor person, that's a lot of money. You're only leaving, let's say, $1,000. That's 10% of your wealth. You won't do it. Only rich people have wills. Go to Canada. How do you make a will? You go to a store and you buy a piece of paper called will. And you fill up the form. To my children, my daughter, my son, I leave this, this, and this. Then you go find three people and say, watch me sign this. You sign it, and they sign, they saw it. It's a will. That's it. It costs you half a dollar. Or, in the US, you can go to willmaker.com and make the will online. It cost $19.95, and it's fine. Perfectly good will. That's the difference in one way between Guatemala <coughs> and Canada. Guatemala has a very high cost legal system. 
Canada has a relatively low cost, accessible legal system. So you need those elements, rule of law and property. But you need something more. And this is what Professor McCluskey has been explaining in her books. You need innovation. You need a culture that is open to the future, willing to tolerate and accept change. Joseph Schumpeter, I think an underappreciated economist, who is often misunderstood, he believed socialism was inevitable. Some people concluded he was a socialist. Not at all. He was merely depressed and pessimistic about the future. But he was not a socialist. He thought it was a disaster, but he thought it was inevitable. He defined capitalism as follows, quote, that subspecies of all the systems characterized by private property, close quote. Now notice it means there's private property, but capitalism <coughs> is a smaller subset of that. That's not enough. Quote, which carries out new combinations of factors of production and involving the creation of credit. Now that's a very rich definition. New combinations of factors of production means innovation, new products no one had thought of before. And involving credit means more complex forms of property, which requires a higher degree of legal order. Professor McCloskey and her wonderful eye-opening book, talks about, quote, private property and free labor without central planning, so there's a negative characteristic, no central planning, regulated by the rule of law and ethical consensus, close quote. She also refers, in the same sentence, quote, the age of innovation. Now the key to economic growth is innovation. In the book, she does a wonderful job of destroying every other theory of economic growth, or at least showing it is not enough to explain the modern world. So every theory I've ever heard of in my life, and some so obscure I had never heard of them, she systematically shows it cannot explain the modern world. Either it cannot explain growth at all, or it explains a little growth, but not enough. A doubling in a hundred years, not eight times in a hundred years. So it's a remarkable book, and she argues the key is innovation, boosting yourself, in effect, substantially higher, not just <coughs> slow incremental, but big jumps and leaps. That innovation that is the key to growth was also called by Schumpeter creative destruction. He said in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, quote, the problem that is usually being visualized is how capitalism administers existing structures, whereas the relevant problem is how it creates and destroys them. He thought that was the key. And most economists do not have the intellectual tools to deal with this problem. <coughs> The key is creation and destruction. Now, of course, under socialism, you've got half of that. A lot of destruction, <laughs> but not so much creation to replace what was destroyed. Specifically, what is created is new forms of life, new products, which add value to the world. Now, this leads to a kind of a moral problem. Many people fear change. We are the inheritors of the peasant tradition. Peasants traditionally fear change for a good reason. They live on the edge of existence. A little change in the wrong direction and you die. So peasants are traditionally fearful of change. Getting them to be innovative is difficult. They need enough surplus to be able to suffer losses in order to be willing to take risks and innovate. And that heritage still is in our morality. 
Many people don't like change. They fear it. They have the morality of their great, 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 great grandparents who were on the edge of starvation every day, fearing famine. But we don't live that way anymore. Even in this great economic crisis, people complain about unemployment. But I don't think anyone in America is dying of hunger. I saw an interview on CNN. A woman, she was very angry about the unemployment. She lost her job. She was being interviewed while she was on vacation in Hawaii. <laughs> so it's bad. It's bad. But it's not like it would have been 300 years ago when you just died. She was on vacation in Hawaii worrying about her next job. What we need is a moral code that can be open to the future, that will tolerate innovation and not condemn it, but also appreciates stability. And here is a difficulty in our psychology. To be able to insist on stable rules that don't change day by day, like don't hit other people, don't take their things, don't lie to them, those are stable. We don't want lots of innovation. If you go to an academic conference in philosophy, in my opinion, most philosophers, and that's my background, they're crazy. They always come up with a new moral theory about everything. Well, of course, they're all wrong, most of them at least. They don't work. Let's stick with what works very well. And those old principles that your mother taught you, if you had good mothers, I'm sure you all did, don't hit other people, don't take their things, and don't lie to them. Those are really good rules. And they, I don't think next year there's going to be moral rules 2.0 that will be that much better. There probably will be worse. So how is it? that we can, on the one hand, insist on stable rules, but be open to innovation in culture, society, music, technology, institutions, ways of life. That's difficult. It's hard to do. We need to have some kind of moral foundation for those stable rules. What is that? I'm going to make the following claims about moral philosophy. First. I don't think you have to have only one theory of what is just. There might be several that are compatible. I disagree with those philosophers who say, no, you have to have this theory, that theory is no good, even if they lead to the same conclusion. In my opinion, if we have two reasons for believing something, we should believe it twice as strongly. It's not confusion, it's another reason. So long as the reasons are not contradictory or logically exclusive or incompatible. So I'm a compatibilist. I'll give you an example. The moral philosophers come and say, do you believe in rights, natural rights, or are you a utilitarian? And if I say, well, I like both. No, <laughs> not allowed. You can't fit into my philosophy catalog. You have to be one, utilitarian, or advocate of rights. But I think that's a confusion. You can indeed be both, because they operate at different levels. Utility, or good consequences, justify a system of rules. But if I told you, go out in the world, and everything you do, always generate the best outcome. What would you do? It's impossible to know. If you buy a cappuccino, is that the best outcome for the world, as opposed to buying a tea or a Coca-Cola? There's no way to know that. It's impossible to calculate the implications of every action. But I can know the rules, which we call rights. Rights are the standard of behavior. What am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to do? And utility, or consequence, is the goal. So if we understand right, provide the standard of how I should behave. But the goal is not to maximize rights. 
The goal is to have a good society, a society of people with dignity, with prosperity, without war, and so on. There might be other reasons that we could promote liberty that would be compatible with those. I think fundamentally, though, there has to be a commitment to moral individualism. And there is a secure, objective foundation for that. You are yourself. Indeed, your connection to your body is inescapable. When, it, when you do escape it, you're dead. As long as you're alive, you're embodied. Epictetus, the great Stoic philosopher, responded to the skeptics called Pyrrhonists and the academic philosophers who said, you can't know anything. And Epictetus was a modest man. He thought you could not know much, but you could know something. He wrote, but that you, and I quote, but that you and I are not the same persons I know very certainly. Where do I derive this knowledge? When I want to swallow something, I take the food to this place and not to this place. <laughs> I'm quite confident I know where is my own mouth. It's certain knowledge. It's not a subject of dispute. That foundation was picked up by the English levelers, early advocates of libertarian ideas, who were very explicit about this. Richard Overton, in prison, wrote an essay. He began, to every, and I quote, to every individual in nature is given an individual property by nature not to be invaded or usurped by anyone. For everyone, as he is himself, so he has a property in himself, else could he not be himself. Just to be yourself, you have to have control of your life, your own body. That your personal identity is constituted by your having control over your own body. John Locke advances these ideas even further, not only in his political writings, but in his metaphysical writings as well. He said, the first thing you own are your actions. As he says, that every person becomes concerned and accountable. He owns and imputes to itself, himself his past actions. You own your actions. You are responsible in the world for what you do. You're not like a stone or a book. If I dropped the book, it did not make any choice. But we as moral agents make choices, and we are as responsible for them. The philosopher Gareth Evans talks about how bodily self-ascription, or ascribing things to your own body, is immune to error through misidentification, as follows. He says, it would be strange to say, someone's legs are crossed. Are they my legs? We know, if the legs are crossed are mine, I know, they are my legs. It's not possible to confuse them with someone else. So moral individualism, ontological or metaphysical, and then moral is a foundation for markets. Why do we want markets rather than other systems? Because we respect other people. I could take from other people what I want. I'm capable of tremendous violence. I'm a very dangerous primate. But I don't do that. I ask them, what would you like in exchange for what you have? Benjamin Constant? the great French Swiss liberal, said that trade and war have a common feature. There are ways to get what you want. But trade is doing so through acknowledging the claim of the other person. There is a fundamental moral recognition of other people at the, at the foundation of the market. And then finally, that system reinforces itself in a very important way. 
One thing I have seen is a change in moral behavior in formerly communist countries. There's less brutality in many ways. People respect lines and cues more than they used to in the past. Maybe not as much as English people, but it's not surprising that England, which is the, one of the great examples of this, people line up very patiently and politely in a queue. I love that about England. They respect each other. To go to the head of the line is considered a terrible thing to do. In many countries, it's just normal. You just trample on old people or crippled people. Just push them aside. This I've seen in China, and it's changing. Communism brutalized people. <coughs> Because if you did not push them aside, you did not live. You died, or your children died. So people became brutal. But now in China, people are becoming polite. They're now more respectful of other people. And that's because of capitalism. It's because of Starbucks. It's because of privately owned restaurants. It's because under capitalism, you have to ask the following question. What if I were the other person? What would I want? That's what markets are about. You learn to think, what if I were that person? It reinforces it very deeply. And it is not an accident, as a consequence, that England was also the source of the world anti-slavery movement, because people came to think, what if I were a slave? How would I like that? Before that, most people never considered it. It didn't matter to them. But the English said, that's terrible. And they actually outfitted two fleets to suppress the slave trade. As far as I know, there is no public choice explanation for that. They were not being selfish. They were horrified by slavery and spent enormous resources to get rid of it. The first movement for the rights of children who are being abused, for people to take an interest in the well-being of children who are not even your own and even support for the interest of animals. The English to this day are the most extreme humanitarians. Thousands of English people go out to pick up frogs and carry them across the road during the mating season. They think, well, if I were a frog and I wanted to go mate and have sex, it would be terrible if a car crushed me. So they go and move the frogs. It creates a certain kind of personality. So let me conclude by suggesting that free market capitalism should be distinguished from cronyism very strongly. It should be emphasized the free market part, not only the capitalist part. It has a moral foundation based on respect for every human being, and it reinforces that morality among all of us every day. Thank you very much.
инновации. Кто говорит, инновация это хорошо, российский добродетельство на самом деле вас слушает. Кстати, то же самое происходит и с предпринимательством. Я несколько дней назад читал очередную версию основных направлений деятельности правительства, и там, в общем, существенный раздел посвящен поддержке предпринимательства, но это обычно читать как малого и среднего бизнеса. Таким образом, на первый взгляд, государство следует а, совету Тома. Вот Том, что бы вы ответили правительству, правильно ли оно? Правильно ли оно поддерживает инновации предпринимательства? I think that that's a bit like um, government-sponsored sex. <laughs> you can imagine how exciting that would be as administered by a government bureau. Very romantic. Uh, I think the mistake is what I call cargo cult economics. Cargo cults are in the Pacific South Seas areas where the Japanese and the United States fought in the Second World War. Primitive Stone Age people, I'm not including Russian bureaucrats or primitive or Stone Age, but of course not. But primitive Stone Age people came into contact with people who had airplanes and matches and metal implements. And the Americans landed there and they built landing fields to bring in the airplanes and control towers with people wearing these on the, on the control tower. And they gave the local people matches so they could start fires and knives, metal knives. This represented at least a doubling of their income. So very poor people. Now you could catch twice as many fish and so on. They gave them a lot of implements. Then the war ended and the airplanes went away. So what did the local people do? They're scientific. They realized if you want the big birds to come from the sky, you have to build a landing place for them. So they made airports all out of wood with wooden control towers. And in it are men sitting there with bamboo headphones. <laughs> and they want to bring the birds down and then they'll get more nice things. They, they didn't make the connection that there was a war happening. Their, their perspective on the world was limited. They didn't know Japanese and Americans and so on. And I think this is cargo cult policy making. Uh, instead of creating the conditions of freedom for people to innovate, what they do is they say, we're going to create an innovation park. We'll put buildings there, and we hope the little entrepreneurs will fly down and take them to the village. But they misunderstand what it is that attracts the little birds. It's not a big building, and it's certainly not a grant from the Ministry of Making People Miserable, which is what government ministries are like. Uh, if you get a grant from even the National Science Foundation in America, plan on filling out a form at least this big, just to get your grant. What you find in innovation, places like Bangalore in India, this was not planned by the government. The government didn't want it. They told them not to do it. But Indian entrepreneurs realized they had smart people who spoke English. So when my Microsoft product isn't working, I call a toll-free number, and someone answers the phone, and he says, hello, this is Steve. <laughs> I know his name is not Steve, and he's in Bangalore, and his name is Avinash or something. But that's okay, because he helps me solve my problem, because these are very smart people, and their income has gone up amazingly. 300 million people lifted from poverty to middle class prosperity. Silicon Valley was not planned by the federal government of the United States. We can go down the list. That's not what creates it. What you need is the right conditions that attract people who can think different thoughts. And usually 
government projects are not a good place for that. There's some exceptions, but I think this is cargo call. 